Hello. Welcome, friends. Welcome. I am so grateful and appreciative to see all of you here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our second final session of Four Together. My name is Audra Friend, she, her. I'm the Digital Communications Data and Technology Specialist with the Organizing Strategy Side with Love staff team. And I'm just going to walk us through a quick orientation and some um, agreements for our evening together. I am a fat, white, femme presenting woman with dark hair and dark frame glasses. I'm wearing a gray sweatshirt and I have a huge bank of windows behind me with some kind of bright light in front of me. I, um, I'm going to read through some agreements to just help us be really fully present. I hope you all internalized the slide before. Please be here in the space as you are. Move, be still. Breathe deep, you know, and, and let us know how we can connect. Yeah, so please use the space you are in as you need or prefer. Sit in chairs, sit on the floor, pace, lay down, rock, clap, spin, move around, move in, out, and around your space. Communicate through your body, chat, Zoom features, voice, close your eyes, draw, doodle, write, eat, etc. And some agreements and expectations for tonight. Please bring your full self and share our space. Engage with intention. Take care of yourself and your needs. We'd love to see your face, but we welcome you to be off camera or any other modifications that will better tend to your needs. Honor our individual and collective dignity. Use nonpartisan language. This means we are not discussing candidates or political parties. Take what is useful for you and feel free to ignore anything that isn't. Be kind to our presenters and participants. Remember our shared values of interdependence, pluralism, justice, transformation, generosity, and equity. And we have chaplain support available this evening if needed. So um, if folks can see, I have a little like asterisk, that little star sign in front of my name. Uh, I'm, we are excited that we can offer chaplain support. And so if you need chaplain support, please send me a direct message through the chat. So it's asterisk Audra dash chaplain support. You can find that by opening up the chat window. If you go to the bottom, there's a little blue button that says everyone. If you toggle that, you should be able to find or you can type star Audra AU and start to fill it out. And that's how you can direct message me. I will then send you to a breakout room where a chaplain will meet you. For additional pastoral care and support, all are welcome to reach out to your ministerial team. In addition, Black UUs can reach out to Black Lives of UU and Black Indigenous People of Color UUs can reach out to DRUM. And just a quick orientation. So our agenda for tonight, I'm introducing things. We'll have a grounding and quick landscape from Nicole Presley, meeting the moment with Carrie McDonald. Our work ahead, Unitarian Universalism in the Broader Landscape with Reverend Elizabeth Wen and Reverend Tyler Coles, with a video uh, briefing from Reverend Angela Tyler Williams, what is ahead from Nora Rasman, and a closing. And now I'd like to invite Nicole Presley, Director of the Organizing Strategy staff team, to take over. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is it is wonderful to see all your faces uh, and to be in this community with you uh, this evening. Um, wow, it feels, it feels like the the first meeting we had together was so long ago, um, and I think that that is information. Um, time moves in a different way when. Life is chaotic uh, when we have deep and real fears about what is happening, um, what may get worse, what might be new things that we never imagined. Um, and it's just really important to be grounded in these times when things will move fast, when things will be uh, chaotic, when um, our despair might have us forget all that is available to us 
um, through ourselves, our practices and, and in community. Um, and I say this, of course, having gone through, you know, my chaotic couple of weeks. Um, so if you are like me, um, since the last time we met on November 6th, I've had a lot of time to think, some of it useful, some of it not. I have, you know, engaged in the fullness of my anger uh, and my fear in ways where I felt like I have worked out all the solutions, right? This is exactly what we need to do if everyone would just listen. I have my list of organizations uh, that I think need to be strengthened and donated to and joined and the list of ones that I think would just should just disappear because they're not doing it right. Um, I have a chart of strategies that I think are absolutely necessary in this moment and tactics that we should just throw in the trash. I have a list of allies and enemies of the places that I now intend to boycott and all of the many skills I am going to somehow acquire very quickly as to not depend on the state. I have attempted to solve everything by myself in an apartment <laughs> through rage and sadness. I'm sure you probably have too at some point. So <laughs> this is me saying that I think that's pretty normal. <laughs> it's just, we need to know that that is what we go through. And then we need to find a better place, a more generative place to do our work from. And that has to involve people that has to involve our most grounded, loving, and generous selves. Um, I will name that I am very bad, right? I'm like, oh, I remember all these different webinars that I attended that you know told me I, I should really get some good spiritual practices and a good in a hurry, because when things get hard, <laughs> you're gonna wanna be disciplined in them. So I'm going to, um, be honest and say the best one that I have, right? Because um, as people in my faith tradition say, the Lord is still working on me. The best one that I have is deeply breathing. So I'm going to invite you all to do that with me now, um, to take that time to relax your shoulders, to unclench your jaw, to plant yourself physically in ways that feel good and comfortable for you. And just breathe. Take a deep breath in. Remind yourself that you are not alone. Breathe out. Another deep breath in and hold that uncomfortable knowledge that you can't do this alone. Breathe out. And another last deep breath in, knowing that there are people here with you in this work. And breathing out, knowing that you too are with them. It is critical for us to stay, to find ways. I'm not gonna say stay grounded. That's not gonna happen for me. Um, but find ways to know when we have to be grounded and rooted. Um, because that is the best place from which we do this work. Um, and as we remember, um, the last time we were in a moment similar to this, in this country post 2016, we knew that every day, every day was a lot. 
every day were new terrible statements, laws, practices. And so now we know information is a blessing. Now we are very clear that this is a marathon and not a race. It is probably multiple marathons. <laughs> um, so we need to rest. We need to study. We need to practice. And we need to learn. Knowing that evaluation will build resilience and strength for better and more impactful strategies. Um, and know that we have to do it together. In all things, as Miriam Kaba says, everything worthwhile is done with other people. So I'm going to go over very quickly just some like, what broadly <laughs> have we seen and should really be noticing um, since we gathered last? One of those things that I want to note um, is the dismantling of ideas and structures that even suggest that government exists for the public good. The things that we like, the things that we rely on, whether they may be public schools or public parks, um, there is an effort to dismantle. Um, I am reminded by Toni Morrison's words when she talks about uh, racism and fascism. And she says that fascism changes citizens into taxpayers so that individuals become angry at even the notion of the public good. It changes neighbors into consumers so that the measure of our values as humans is not our humanity or our compassion or our generosity, but what we own. It changes parenting into panicking so that we vote against the interests of our children, against their healthcare, their education, their safety from weapons. And in effecting these changes, it produces the perfect capitalist one who is willing to kill another human being for a pro product or kill generations for control of products, oil, drugs, fruit, gold. I share those words with you because so much about what we are experiencing now and will be experiencing in a more devastating and heightened way has patterns. And it is important for us to get to know them well um, because every organization, including the Unitarian Universalist Association, right? And our Side with Love program, your state action network, so much is going to happen that we have to act locally in our own communities. We are not gonna have an action alert for every single thing that we in fact must fight against. And so it is really important for us to start looking at things and going, okay, this is a part of that project. And this is who we become when we start believing it is inevitable or believing that we don't have power. And we have to resist that, right? We have to resist being like, oh, there's consumer strategies. For this. We have to resist the idea that rights for some, right, um, means that we don't get rights, means that fighting for them means I'm not fighting for myself, um, and truly understand that we are all in this together. Let us remember that the antidote to every single one of these issues is community and care and generosity and that those are in fact infinite resources. And the last thing I want to note about what we are witnessing in this time 
is people picking fights they think they can win. And that says a whole lot about us rather than about them. We all know the poem, right, that starts, first they came for as a warning uh, that our solidarity is a moral and strategic imperative. Right now, we know that attacks on immigrants or anyone who might be seen as an immigrant or anyone who occupies some type of identity that doesn't immediately scream, this is who an American is, because that's in fact what this is about, are under attack and will be under attack. We already saw even in the current administration, more right-wing bills um, around immigration. We have seen post uh, election day, a massive scapegoating of trans people. And I think some of this is in fact because of people and their actual hateful ideologies. Um, but I also think it is just strategy. It is a calculated guess that we won't show up. It is a calculated guess that we will say, well, I'm a citizen. Well, I own a home. Well, I have a job. Well, I'm not trans. Well, I'm not LGBTQ. Well, I'm not a person of color. Well, I'm not, that is in fact the strategy. It is not about them and their power. It is about what they think they can pick up, who they think they can throw away, and who we will allow them to throw away. And so it is essential that as we see the fights that we have to embark on in our local communities, in our states, as a nation, that the work is now, that the work is all of us, that we have to show up in full force for all of the battles. And that is a us thing. That is not you individually have to show up for every single thing. That is not sustainable. Um, but we all must find our role in this work um, because this is real and that is what we are witnessing. And we are also witnessing many organizations being in conversation, a groundswell as what always happens of people joining organizations, building community pods, delving into mutual aid work, the solutions in fact, are not new, just the people joining the movements. We are the ones that are new. Um, and I know you are all in this. So keep joining the work, keep taking care of yourselves, keep taking care of each other. Be very clear that under what we will face, taking care of one another is a radical political act. Community, generosity, care, mutual aid, support, protection is an absolutely essential and very political act because that is the thing that we build governments to generally do, right? It's a way to scale our care. It is a way to scale our protection. Um, but what I know about democracy is that at the end of the day, it's us, it is the people. We are the government. We are our community. And we are still here. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm happy to be in this work with you. And uh, you'll hear more um, in the coming weeks and months from how Unitarian Universalists are responding. 
the sorry very last thing that I said I was going to drop in the chat is one of the first ways we get ready is by knowing who we have what our skills are what we're willing to offer so I just dropped in the chat and we'll continue to a asset map we're asking all individuals uh, to take this survey it is very quick about what you have and what you are willing to offer for our national, state, and local efforts to organize our power uh, in this moment, to take care of one another, um, to resist, um, and to build the world uh, that we know is possible. Thank you. Folks, we're going to get you the right link in the chat in just a second. Nicole just dropped it, so use, and we will post that one. Amazing, and now we're going to hear from Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you, Nicole. Friends, I am Carrie McDonald. I'm Executive Vice President of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Uh, my visual description is that I'm a light-skinned, multiracial person in my late 30s. I have chin like dark curly hair um, and I'm wearing a gray blazer and a necklace and a green shirt and I am sitting in my uh, attic with a green wall and a little Lego flower behind me and um, I use they and he pronouns I am calling in from Malden Massachusetts just outside of Boston in the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts people and I want to just appreciate the um, wisdom and the planning that my colleagues who work for the UUA have brought to this call. The reality is that our Unitarian Universalist Association, the central organization for our national faith community has been thinking and planning about what might happen as a result of these elections for months now. We looked at different scenarios and this was absolutely one of them. And you can see that immediately after our election, we had these great webinars already lined up. Um, we had some things we were prepared to do depending on different outcomes. Uh, but that sense of planning, of preparation, is a lot of what we're thinking about right now and how we're entering these next few months to come. We know that in times of challenge and difficulty and crisis, we have to communicate so much more. That's just good advice for life. And so we at the UUA have amped up uh, our communications. We are doing weekly emails um, and to all of our religious leaders, our congregational leaders, to talk about key themes. Um, we've done videos on social media. We've done statements after the election and so on. And, and we'll be continuing to keep up that pace of communication as we all seek to process uh, what the results of the election might be for ourselves and for our communities. Two weeks ago, my colleague, the Reverend Ashley Horan, who's the Vice President of Programs and Ministries, talked about uh, those, some of those initial responses and being ready to welcome people. And that was one of our message to congregational leaders. This week, we've got another one coming out um, to help us meet the moment. And it's really about how we think about our risk and our safety uh, as Unitarian Universalists. As Nicole laid out for us, uh, the threats are very real and present for Unitarian Universalists, for people we love, people in our communities, our neighbors, right now in this country. Right-wing actors are emboldened. Political leaders have threatened retribution against anyone who opposes their agendas. And while we can't know all of what is to come, we do know it will be very, very bad. And so I want to say that fear is very, re is very real and very rational. It's a reasonable response. Um, to that concern, not just for our neighbors and our partners, for ourselves, for our own congregational members, it can be easy to get lost in the kind of fear that makes us feel stuck, like we don't know where to begin, or like we have to fight everything, everywhere, all at once, which is impossible. We can also channel that heightened awareness that that fear points to um, in ways that help us prepare for the long haul. I'm not much of a marathon runner, I will tell you in that metaphor, but I am a hiker. And the way that I learned to hike is that regardless of how much you're carrying, how steep the trail is, you hike at the pace that you can carry on a conversation. You can continue to breathe and hold relationship 
with your hiking buddies. And at that pace, you can go as far as humans can. For many of us and our ancestors, oppression and violence are not new. For some of us, this is a time when it's new to be the target of such state and non-state animosity, violence, and menace. The good news is that we have inherited wisdom and frameworks in our tradition and our partners to make ourselves safer in these times. We are moving away from a binary of always safe to or never safe, away from this pendulum swing that we sometimes have of inattention and naivete or overreaction and panic to instead become more attuned to an ongoing sensibility of what risk is all around us and what it requires. That means strategy and communication and savviness and courage. And being frank and honest about risk is sobering, but it can also release some of the spinning anxiety that holds us back to clearly define what our concerns are and what we can do about them together. So this week's message will be focused on practical things that you can do in your community and your congregation to focus on the physical safety, uh, your space, when you hold public events, do you have good plans in place to make sure that those are safe, especially for those participants who are most likely to be targeted? There are actually grant opportunities right now from the Federal Emergency Management Administration for congregations that need to improve their physical safety. We also talk about digital safety, online safety, where some of the worst harassment can take place thinking about how much exposure, what do you put online and why? Is that strategic? Is that reaching the people you want? Or are we putting out information that allows us to be targeted and by people who wish us harm? And we're actually taking that seriously at the UUA ourselves. We have taken some information um, from our My UUA databases and others and just put them behind a password protected area to make sure that they are not um, uh, out there for anyone who might seek to impersonate us or harass us or our religious professionals. So we are taking that very seriously too. Our work ahead is going to involve more risk. And we want to make sure that we are limiting the places where we don't need to take risks so that we're prepared for the places where we really do, where our values call us to be. We're in a time of building capacity like that um, survey that Nicole put in the chat. We're strengthening ourselves spiritually, mentally, emotionally, organizationally for the struggle ahead. We know we will need to take those risks to live out our values in public, and so we want to be ready. And one other example I'll give you is that last year, the General Assembly, our delegates from our congregations, passed a business resolution embracing transgender, non-binary, intersex, and gender diverse people as a fundamental expression of our values. Now, of course, this work has been and continues to happen in our congregations, but the fact that we have made a statement about it is really important for building the constitutional protection that undergirds that work and must in order for it to continue in the, in the months and years ahead. So take care, friends. You are not alone. It is such a privilege to be with you today. And I will just close on a personal note by saying that I'm someone who's very involved in my local government, and I cannot plus one to that point enough that it will, if you have not engaged with your local government, whether it's a township or a city or a county, it will blow your mind how much impact you can have simply by showing up and sending uh, some well-placed emails. We so often neglect the things that are right in front of us, but the reality is that that is where the rubber will meet the road with the safety of so many of ourselves and our beloveds. And so I just encourage you to figure out what's going on in your own backyard and your front yard and down the block because there is incredible work there that needs to be done. Thank you all and blessings. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, my name is Nora Rasman, and I use she and her pronouns. Um, I'm going to introduce these incredible humans that you see on your screen. Um, I am a white woman with wavy brown hair wearing a um, copper colored sweater and gold necklace, and I'm um, sitting behind a yellow wall and green shade. 
And I am the democracy strategist with a side with love, which means a lot of my work includes holding Are You the Vote programming with a lot of my incredible colleagues at OST who you've already gotten to hear from tonight and who are behind the scenes making all kinds of things happen and getting people the right links and, you know, doing all of the unseen labor that makes it all possible. So I am so grateful to be here tonight with um, Reverend Elizabeth and Tyler, who are two faith-rooted UU, uh, I don't know if you would describe yourselves as organizer, activist, ministers, but that's how I see you in my life, each of you, um, who continue to hold clarity about kind of what is required for our faith in, in this moment and in the troubled times that we are living through and have been for so long. Um, we are going to have kind of like a more conversational moment um, to hear from Reverend Elizabeth and Tyler kind of about how they're each thinking about the moment that we're in, which Nicole kind of teed us up for. And the language that we'll be using for the questions come from the UUA's Meeting the Moment project, um, where our incredible UUA staff teams are engaging with congregations and religious educators and UU organizations about how we build a shared analysis of what our context is in this moment, um, really with the hope that we have a better understanding of our shared skills and resources and interests and capacities as a faith. Um, that gives us a better understanding of our political location and the resources that we have um, to give and share. So with that, would love for y'all to introduce yourselves and kind of like tell us briefly, like what is what would you say the shared moment that we are in today is? Go for it. I will always default to you, Reverend Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, no. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am the Reverend Byron Tyler Coles. I use the he pronouns. I'm a light-skinned Black person with uh, a bald head, tortoise-shelled glasses, and facial hair with a gray undershirt and a blue um, button-down shirt that is slightly open. I'm a member of your Congregational Life staff in the Southern region, and it is a blessing and a privilege uh, to be here with you all. And I'm Reverend Elizabeth Nguyen, um, she, her. I'm a, a Vietnamese multiracial woman in, in my 30s. I have uh, dark wavy hair and light skin, and I'm wearing a beige sweater and just really grateful for all the throwing down of our values that folks are doing and um, feeling sober, grounded, and um, looking forward to talking about what's before us. Thanks, y'all. Um, now that you've introduced yourself, please say your name when you start speaking again. This is Nora. Um, where are we? Yeah, what what would you say? What is the shared moment that we're in? Um, I can say some things, and um, I'm going to speak a little bit specifically. In addition to being a Unitarian Universalist community minister affiliated at First Parish in Malden, I also co-direct the National Bail Fund Network, which is a network of about 90 um, autonomous community-based groups that pay pretrial or protest bail to free folks who are caged before trial uh, and immigration bond to free folks from immigration detention. And so with that um, lens, uh, you know, Nora said, maybe you can speak a little bit about what we're seeing around immigration. So I'm just going to dive in there um, and then we can we can continue the conversation. So probably a lot of what I'm saying isn't necessarily new to folks, but I know that my brain is in seven billion places. So I'm going to say it again for me, for all of us. So we're really in a moment. And we're in a moment of anti-immigrant violence that is being borne out across the world, really. And there is both very high levels of state violence and very profound organizing and resistance. Um, we are in this moment in the United States because of a long bipartisan anti-immigrant project from the current president, um, President Biden, basically mostly effectively closing the southern border through executive actions over the past couple months to even um, those who maybe at some point said they were pro-immigrant governors and mayors, criminalizing immigrants, cutting services to immigrants, 
And in this very devastating wave of dehumanization, detention, and deportation, we see the former candidates for president campaigning on who can be toughest on immigration. Um, again, saying things that are heartbreaking so that we can move from reality. Um, the numbers of people in ICE detention have more than doubled since President Biden took office. Um, and the Thursday after the election, for-profit prison companies were forecasting unprecedented future profits. Our movement, and when I say our movement, I'm specifically talking about where I organize now, our immigrant um, and migrant justice movement, has often had our power limited because of the split between direct survival services and building power and organizing and internal strategy struggles between whether we move for what is politically viable or what we all need and deserve, the freedom to move, stay, return. And you have probably seen, as I have, that so much of this rhetoric has seduced many, even within the immigrant community. The idea that if my life is hard, maybe I can blame someone, someone who's newer to this country than me or someone who doesn't have the job I have or doesn't have the papers I have. And it's the oldest trick in the book, the scapegoat. And this decades old strategic project to portray immigrants and as others have named so many others as responsible for real and fake issues means that the antidote must be, and this our faith can be such a powerful grounding for it, persistently and unapologetically declare that all of our lives deserve to be good, that we demand everything for everyone, all the housing, all the health care, all the freedom to be queer, to live, all of that for everyone. And that in this moment, we must really hold the line that migrant justice is climate justice, is queer justice, is racial justice, is gender justice, is housing justice. And to know that even and especially when those who are most targeted by ISIS violence and vigilante white supremacy violence may or may not be part of our congregations, we must continue to live those values. Um, I'm just gonna say something real short and then I wanna hear from you, Reverend Tyler. Um, and this is really provisional because as folks have shared, we there there's a lot that we can't anticipate. But what we know is that Trump's goals will be to appease and strengthen his base. So we can anticipate that there will be big media splashes around deportations. And though that machine will use the already existing criminal legal systems and the state systems like those in Texas, Florida, Arizona, Iowa, and others um, that already charge immigrants with crimes for migrating. Um, and that again, our role must be to hold the line and to parse through when solutions are offered that might seem more politically viable that focus on children or US citizen children or those most proximate to status, folks with TPS or DACA, to parse through when that's strategic and how we can unapologetically link those hopefully protective wins with unapologetic demands for freedom for, from cages for all, freedom from borders for all. Um, we do know that people who are at the highest risk are people who are already surveilled by ICE, through ICE check-ins, people with prior orders of deportation, people from countries where the logistics are easier to deport people, and people who are in immigration court proceedings already and at the potential risk of increased surveillance, and people in places with a high density of undocumented people where the optics that Trump's wants of workplace and home raids um, make them vulnerable. And we know that probably on day one or somewhere in there, he will try to make big media splashes. And we also know that the grinding deportation machine that's been built by bipartisan efforts over many years will continue in the background. And there is lots of places for protection and intervention in all of those scenarios. Okay. Reverend Tyler. Vietnamese and a UU minister. 
Thank you so much, Reverend Elizabeth. This is uh, Reverend Tyler. As I come to this question of what is the shared moment we're in, I come to the, the wisdom and teaching of Audrey Lord. When she asks us or she poses the reality that the personal is political. The personal is political. Beyond my work as a minister in our shared faith and working with your congregational life uh, staff, uh, supporting congregational leaders across the American South, Northern Mexico, and the Caribbean. I'm a movement chaplain and work often with queer and trans people of color across the American South through an organization called Southerners on New Ground or Song for short. And that is the space and place where I, where my political home is. That is where I do organizing. And so I bring all of that to this question of what is this shared moment that we are in and taking Audre Lorde's wisdom, if the personal is political, so too is our spirituality. So too is our spiritual orientation and understanding in the world. As I reflect on all of these things, I, I, I have to pose the question, what is Unitarian Universalism doing for us in this moment? What has Unitarian Universalism done for any of these moments before? And what can Unitarian Universalism do for us in all of the moments to come? And these last couple of weeks, I've been uh, peering over social media and talking to colleagues and think, you know, talking to friends. And there has been uh, much anxiety and grief and despair and sorrow and frustration and sorrow. And as speakers before have already shared, all of that is real. I do not question it whatsoever. But I think it is really important that we do ask and acknowledge the fact there, that there is also feelings of indifference. There are feelings of not being surprised. There are feelings or orientations of, frankly, naivety that one political party or one personal orientation will save us from the mess that we are in because we have to be reminded that the American political system that we live in is functioning the way it was designed. So I have to remind myself as a practicing Unitarian Universalist, someone who believes unequivocally that we are of one creation bound up and set free through love, that I am called with you, my siblings, to respond to the sorrow and the grief and the pain and the frustration of a, a machine that wants to eat us up and to be honest about it. And so in this moment, while we have these two months to kind of hold ourselves and get in formation, taking the wisdom of Beyonce at hand to get in formation, that we grieve, that we just grieve, that we lament, that we throw ashes, that we render our garments, that we place our stones, that we throw salt in the water. Heck, maybe we, we need to productively break a thing in a controlled environment. But we must grieve and process the feelings that we are going to have in us, that are in us, before we get into organizing mode. And I say this because that first day after the election, the feeds were full of sorrow and pain. And then I saw our people too quickly pivot towards, well, today I am angry, and so I'm going to organize. While anger is a real force and fuel for organizing, anger will consume us up and is not always the most sustainable juice for organizing, especially as the spiritual people who have to uh, you know, traverse all of the emotions at one time. So in this moment, I am asking us to grieve and to grieve deeply and to grieve intentionally for the long road ahead. Thank you both, both for the granular truth telling of where we are and the meta, how can we be, who who must we be? And I think that leads me to the next question, which is really, what would you say this moment is calling us to become? Us being leftists, radicals, progressives, Unitarian Universalists, um, people of the global majority, those of us who feel particularly directly under threat, um, what would you say that this moment is calling us to do and to become? 
Um, Reverend Elizabeth here, and I can do a little more in the granular and maybe Reverend Tyler will have a, a spiritual word. Um, we, many of us, um, those of us who have friends and family who um, are in precarious places because of immigration status, will continue to live with fear and we will live with it and not let it rule us. Those of us who are less targeted in this moment will learn again and again what solidarity and risk and digging deep means. And those of us who will and have been and are targeted will learn again and again what it means to hold our power and dignity no matter the onslaught, to pass down cultures and care, to draw our people close and refuse annihilation. We will not let fascism mean that we settle for crumbs or turn on one another. Instead, we will turn to lineages of people who have looked the violence of domination in the face and survived. We will look to the Mikazuki people who refused the trail of tears and hid in the Everglades and lived, to Kiani Sugihara, the Japanese diplomat who wrote illegal travel visas for Jewish families fleeing Lithuania as he fled the Nazis and threw blank pieces of paper with just his signature and seal out the window so families could fill in their names. The boat captains right now facing criminal charges for refusing to let boats of refugees sink in the Mediterranean. And the many UU congregations who've provided accompaniment and organized for migrant justice for years. I think of my father who was sponsored by a Lutheran family who he had never met <clears throat> until they arrived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I, will, I think of my husband's family who lived through decades without documents, facing down fears and uncertainty with the persistent belief that their lives were worth protecting and respecting. And those who right now, maybe even tonight, inside ICE detention, watch the news of the calls for mass deportations and continue to fight for their own freedom. There are so many places of intervention. If you don't already know, do some mapping. Where is your local immigration port, court? Where are the district courts where people get picked up by ICE? Where do people go to check in with ICE in your region? Who is organizing? What is the worker center, the undocumented student group, the union, the mutual aid and neighborhood groups? Don't go it alone. That is one of our strongest ways of protecting each other. And if people ask for support, go with and inventory our strengths. Can we offer sponsorship, home hospitality, volunteer time, a pen pal, money for legal defense and bond? No, free printing, space. Connect to local groups. And if you can, offer clearly what you can offer. And be resilient if you don't hear back or the group doesn't need what you can offer or doesn't have time to respond. But in this moment of such high state violence, inventorying what we can offer collectively as we're doing through Side With Love and on the local level is one of our sharpest tools against violence. And I saw folks shouting out UU Rise in the chat. I have a bunch of links that I'll also put in the chat of groups, um, UU and otherwise that we can look to in this time. Reverend Tyler. Thank you, dear one. This is Tyler, and I just want to echo what Reverend Elizabeth said, and I want to be very clear with the the Trinity, as I think, and are breaking it down for myself. I know I said the T word amongst Unitarians and Universalists and Unitarian Universalists, but I think we have to be really clear about three things. We need to slow down. Whiteness is this thing, white supremacy culture is this thing that tells us we got to go, 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 and it's unsustainable. We are in this long haul journey towards freedom that is centuries, millennia old. So we must be, we must slow down to be intentional about what we are doing. We must go deep in our reserves, in ourselves, in our communities in our understandings of our faith as a thing that might buoy us in this moment, we must ask ourselves if we actually do believe in love and if love actually has the power to change the world and are we willing to play in the, the ring with love to overturn hell? Like we must get clear about this. We can't play with love anymore. 
We can't play church anymore. So what are we willing to do in this moment? And we must be proximate with our relationships. We must build relationships and we must go deep and get clear with our relationships. I find it ironic and frankly troubling that after the lockdowns of COVID, mind you, the pandemic is still raging, right? We spent all of this time talking about relationships. And in the last year or two, I've been working with congregations talking about where are your relationships? Where are your relationships? And frankly, many of them got comfortable and vulnerable enough to say we actually didn't build any during COVID. Beloveds, we need to have real, sustainable, deep relationships in this moment. And not like a, oh, I know that person, but like, I know that person, right? That's the kind of relationships that we need right now. We have to hold one another. We're not going to be in perfect alignment 24-7, and that's okay. But in our relationships, we can be clear about what needs to be focused on right here, right now, for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you both for the sermonette, for our spirits. Um, if we can give some love in the chat to Reverends Tyler and Elizabeth um, and follow them, find them, you know, yes, you can find their writings on, on the UUA website. So find them if you need some um, spiritual tending. Um, and now my task is kind of like, where do we go from here? What What is ours to do? I think one of the pieces that I'm sitting with that Tyler talked about, which is kind of how I arrive here, is a recognition that maintaining these relationships, growing new relationships in the years ahead is actually going to get harder. And uh, organizations are going to be less resourced. People are going to be more scared and facing greater threats towards their safety and well-being and autonomy. And we know that we can never be cavalier with each other's or our own safety. And it is important in our work to take the lead of folk strategies who are most impacted to keep them safer. So we know that in times ahead, people's relationships to each other, including assistance, mutual aid, just support, um, will we'll be coming under greater scrutiny. And it's intentional because of the power of relationships. And so an invitation um, that as we continue to grow and strengthen relationships, it will require us to stretch beyond our, our usual meeting times and maybe the ways that we're used to doing things. Elizabeth gave a really creative, lengthy list of all the different ways that we can redistribute and be generous with the resources that we have um, as Unitarian Universalists. And it might seem really simple, right? Like build relationships. Wow, you y'all have been saying that for years. But it's like attending to them will really require a persistence and attention um, that I think will really require a tremendous dedication. And I'm hopeful that we can practice it and do it together. It also is going to require us to think through our different understanding of how we build power. And uh, many of us are familiar with how we do formal systems change work within existing bureaucracies. And I think that we have opportunities to think about how are we what is our responsibility to ourselves and each other to learn about what our work it is when governing bodies are unpetitionable in some ways as people use that language um, under Trump's first administration. And so we have, we have so much opportunity um, and I am so, so grateful to be doing it together. And I think folks have kind of mentioned, but continuing to understand that we know there are people living under authoritarian conditions within the United States right now who have much to gain and learn from. And then there's much to be gained from removing ourselves from the U.S.ness of our context and people who have tools and resources and networks and relationships outside of a U.S. context who have learned how to protect their communities under similar circumstances. So I just want to end with deep appreciation for the incredible work that so many people on this um, call tonight have held over the last weeks, months, and years. Thank you to the incredible work of our state action networks. Thank you to the incredible regional life staff who are here tonight and who we work alongside 
find your regional life staff at the UUA, show them some love and gratitude, support their work. Um, and we'll dr drop lots in the chat. Um, so next, what's our homework? Um, one final slide I think that we have, which is the UUA launched something called the Community Resilience Hub a couple weeks ago. It will continue to be a resource and page with um, opportunities for deepening both our like political analysis, but also taking meaningful action. We have two, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, we have one gathering this Thursday that we're holding with Black Lives of UU and DRUM. Um, and this is going to be oriented towards spiritual tending and building somatic practices collectively. We hope that you will join us. Um, and then uh, we this is hot off the presses. Um, we will be marking the incredible work of the UU The Vote of 2024 on Tuesday, January 14th. So um, in line with Tyler's recommendation that we must grieve, we must slow down, we are going to take a beat and we hope that you do the same thing um, and come back in January and we tell the story of what has happened and what we have learned. And then two weeks after that, we will gather for a Good Trouble congregation celebration. With that, I am going to close our evening. Thank you so much for being here. Just deep, deep appreciation um, for all that joined and for all of the speakers, all the folks who held all the pieces um, behind the scenes to, um, to our master Zoom and chat support, um, Jolanda, Kathy, and Audra, and to the chaplains. Thank you. And take good care. Oh, I lost the music if you're still playing it, Jolanda. Sorry about that. <laughs>